All right, guys, let's go to Luke chapter 10 this morning. Listen as fastly, fast as you can. Luke chapter 10. We are in the study of the case files of Dr. Luke, and today we're in chapter 10. I'm going to read the verses as we go. I'm going to preach to you about judges are joyous in America. Let's read verse 10 just to kick us off. Now, after this, the Lord appointed 70 others and sent them two and two ahead of him to every city and place where he himself was going to come. You know, America has just seen this explosion of technological advances lately, and it's hard to keep up with so many different changes. So I actually made a list of things, and I asked Bobby Hood to help me out with some of these technology terms, and uh, this is what he told me. I asked him on the list, said, what is the download? He said, that's when you get in the firewood off the back of your truck. I said, okay. Uh, I said, well, what, what about megahertz? He wrote down, that's when you drop a piece of that firewood on your foot, all right? Um, I said, well, you know, they have a monitor, you know, that screen. What, what do you call, what's a screen? He said, that's what you put up when them, them darn black biting flies are coming around, you know? I said, well, what about a megabyte? He said, that's what those flies do, them megabyte you. I said, well, what about a chip? What is a chip? He said, well, that's what you eat when you're watching the football game. Oh, okay. I said, what about, what about a microchip? He said, that's the, what's left at the bottom of the bag when you've been eating them. I, what about a modem, Bobby? Bobby said, well, that's what I do to my hay fields. I mow them. So, uh, um, and I, I said, what about software? He said, well, that's in plastic forks and spoons that you use. And I said, well, all right, one last one. What about random access memory? He said, that's what I get when Rita asked me how much I paid for that rifle. I get random access most of us in here have computers or smartphones or something, and we, we, we have this, this great network now of sharing ideas and carrying thoughts all over the world, but it's kind of weird to me that as we progress, if you will, in the information age, we decline spiritually and morally. It's happening all around us. In Luke chapter 10, we're going to see something interesting, that God not only holds individuals responsible for what happens in their life, but we also see that, that God holds communities and nations, cities, all of these things in account. So we're going to break this down like this. We're going to talk about this call that goes out to these 70. Put that in your notes, the call, okay? Luke's gospel account is the only one that tells us about the sending of the 70. They send us that. These are not apostles, okay? They're not given names. He just says that he sent them out. It's a reminder to all of us sitting here today, if you are saved, with salvation comes a responsibility to join the work of the kingdom. It is, it is never separated. Jesus always expected it. He would look at somebody and say, follow me, and immediately they become a part of the working in the kingdom. Some would go great distances. We'd call them foreign missionaries today. Some would do work in vocational areas to preach or to teach or to do lead songs, play the piano. Others are called to do neighboring things, but all of us are called to do something. Jesus did not leave the ministry to the 12 apostles, okay? If you think about that, this has already happened. They've already gone out. So neither does God leave it to staff members and all. He's expanding his group of disciples here, and I will say for all the centuries since then. Look at verse 2. And he was saying to them, the harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. Here's the call. Therefore, beseech the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into his harvest. Go your ways. Behold, I send you as lambs in the midst of wolves. Carry no purse, no bag, no shoes. And greet no one on the way. And whatever house you enter, first say, peace be to this house. And if a man of peace is there, your peace will rest upon him. But if not, it will return to you. And stay in that house, eating and drinking what they give you. For the laborer is worthy of his wages. Do not keep moving from house to house. And whenever you, in whatever city you enter... And they receive you, eat what is set before you, and heal those in it who are in it who are sick, and say to them, the kingdom of God has come near to you. 
These are nearly identical instructions that he gave to the 12 that he already sent out. We preached it in Luke chapter 9. We preached about a, a word from Jesus to simplify your life. We talked about them. They were given the power over demons, and they were given the power to heal and all that. And the same thing is happening here. He has recruited 70 additional soldiers for his army. We're not told their names. We're not told how he recruited them. We're not told where he selected them from. We're just told they're part of the kingdom. And when he called on them, they were ready, ready to go. Notice the nature of this work that they're called. First of all, it is an understaffed work. It's an understaffed work. He said there's so much work to do and there's not nearly enough people to do it. So what does he tell them? Ask God to send some help. Beseech the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into his harvest. The first thing that you and I are to do is to pray for God to help with this work. Now, why, why do we pray? Well, first of all, because it's the Lord's work. You and I cannot do this. It is a miracle of God for a man or woman to be washed clean of their sins, to receive the, Jesus, the Lord Jesus Christ, and to be saved. And if there is going to be a great harvest, it has got to be a work of the Spirit. So first of all, it's the Lord's work. So we pray to Him to send us workers. And the other thing that I believe that this does is when you pray for it, earnestly pray for workers, you cannot help but yourself get involved, okay? You cannot earnestly pray for something from your heart and not feel the need to be a part of it. When we pray that God would send somebody, it falls on us first. So we pray for those laborers. So it's a, it's a big task. It's an understaffed work. It's also dangerous work. To go into the evangelistic field like this was dangerous. You're going to face opposition and danger. Jesus says, go your ways. Behold, I send you out as lambs in the midst of wolves. Now, if you're sending out a group of folks to do work for you, you would think that Jesus would be more like a football coach, okay? That he'd want to fire them up. Okay, guys, here's what we're going to do. You need to be hungry, and you need to be mean, and you need to be relentless, and we're going to go out there, and we're going to give them Jesus. We need to go get them. Be hungry for your work. Go. But he does the opposite. He says, men, there, there are people out there that are in desperate need of this message. And I am sending you out there. It is not an easy place to go. But I want you to feed them. I want you to give them all that you have, all that you are. Don't worry about your material needs. You just pour your heart into this work. It's an urgent work. An urgent work. He conveys this sense of urgency by telling them to travel light, okay? He says, greet no one along the road. You're saying, well, he's telling you to be rude. <laughs> no, he's not. There is a Jewish custom in that day that in, when you encountered somebody, that there would be this long, elaborate conversation with them. It was a custom to be there and, and these time-consuming greetings. And Jesus says, don't waste time with that stuff. Don't do what is expected. What's falling over there? He says, says, don't get your life cluttered up with a lot of excess stuff. Be focused in what you do. And in verse 7, he says, remain in the same house. People have wondered about, what do you mean by that? What he's saying is, don't be jumping from house out. Go somewhere, settle in, and then go out and do the work in the field around you. In other words, if you go house to house, it becomes a social event. And he's saying, this is not social work. This is spiritual work. You have this time that you are supposed to go out and stay focused. And listen to me, this work has not diminished. We have become more distracted, but this work has not diminished. It is worthwhile, though. That's the last one there. I think it's an important principle that's here that keeps us sometimes from sharing the gospel, from being a part. You know what it is? Well, it's just too much to do. It's just too much. I mean, what am I? What good can I do? What difference can I make? The whole world's going to hell in a handbasket. How how am I going to help in this? There's no way my efforts can make a dent. I always remember a story. I've been telling this story for 30 years. There was an old man walking down the seashore, and on the sea, all of these starfish had washed up on the sea. And he's walking along, and this guy's watching him throw things into the sea. He goes down, what are you doing? He says, well, I'm throwing these, these starfish back in the ocean. And the guy says, are you nuts? There's a mile of them down through here. There are literally millions of these things. How could you make a difference? How could you have an impact on this? What difference would it make? 
And the old man picked up one and looked at it and tossed it out in the water. He said, it made a difference to that one. Made a difference to that one. Guys, I know this is a big work, and then we look around in our world today and say nobody's listening, nobody cares, but there's one somewhere that you can make a difference with. There is somebody, and our message is to be that the kingdom of God is hand, at hand. Jesus is saying, I am here, I am the king, so the kingdom is at hand. It's as near as the daybreak as the sun falls in the afternoon. We know that daybreak is coming. There is such an important principle here that I want you to grasp with me this morning. I wish I'd put it in your notes. When you receive Christ, okay, not only do we become a part of the kingdom, that's what we always say, right? Well, I become a part of the kingdom, but also this, guys, you listen to me, the kingdom becomes a part of you, a part of you. Not only am I just a participant in it, not only am I just a member in it, but I am a part of the work of it. And I, not only do I enter the kingdom of God, the kingdom of God enters me. So that is the call that he sends out with these 70. Look at the consequence, the consequence. And this is where we really get to our title. Verse 13, woe to you, Chorazin, woe to you, Bethsaida. For if the miracles had been performed in Tyre and Sidon, which occurred in you, they would have repented long ago, sitting in sackcloth and ashes. But it will be more tolerable for Tyre and Sidon, Sidon in judgment than for you. And for you, Capernaum, will you not be exalted to heaven, will you? You will be brought down to Hades. The one who listens to you listens to me. And the one who rejects you rejects me. And he who rejects me rejects the one who sent me. Mm. We always focus on the coming judgment of God on individuals, and that is right. God judges individuals. But we see these two important facts that I want to show you. God judges people groups based on their collective response. Put that in your notes. They were to announce the kingdom of God is here. Why? Because Jesus is here. And he says, if a city rejects Jesus, they are also rejecting the moral demands of the kingdom. The moral demands of a kingdom. God does not judge a community or a nation like he does an individual. Why? Because that community or that 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 city does not have a soul. It doesn't have a soul. So it's a different kind of judgment. But they are still held to the judgment against what God would want them to do. Okay? So the moral compass of the Lord still rests on them. He talks about three cities. He names them by name. Chorazin, Chorazin, Bethsaida, and Capernaum. And then he mentions three evil cities, Sodom, Tyre, and Sidon. He says it will be more tolerable for Sodom than Chorazin and Bethsaida. What do you think he means by that? Is God going to judge all people equally it doesn't don't we aren't we taught that put this in the b god judges on the basis of how much truth has been given how much truth has been given that is true of individuals and it's also true of nations jesus says if those cities had seen what you see if they had had the truth that you have it would have made a difference they would have repented they would have repented Now, God only knows who would repent and who would not, okay? God knows all contingencies. We all play the what-if game. We do. Somebody has a wreck, and we say, well, what if they left five minutes later? Then that truck wouldn't have hit them. Or what if I went to the doctor when I first felt that lump? Or what if I went to the doctor? uh, Or what if I uh, hadn't said those terrible words to my spouse? Or what if I hadn't committed that sin? And we torture ourselves with what if. And the problem with what if is we don't know the answer to that. And we play this game with ourselves. Jesus doesn't play a game because it is not a game to him because he knows what would happen. And he said if those cities had seen what you're seeing, they would have repented. And you are seeing what you're seeing and you're not repenting. That is his message to them. (laughs) It's interesting because Jesus walked this earth in these cities, in Chorazin and Bethsaida. As a matter of fact, he he elected Capernaum for a home base. He spent a lot of time there. Tyre and Sidon were 
Phoenician cities on the coast of the Mediterranean Sea. They were the headquarters for the Baal cult that had child sacrifice. They would have human sacrifice and sexual perversion. As a matter of fact, in Ezekiel chapter 28, Satan himself is called the king of Tyre. That's how wicked that they were. And Jesus says, what if I had visited Tyre and Sidon and performed miracles there? Jesus said they would have repented in sackcloth and ashes. Today, all six of these cities tied up in this message lie in ruins. The most baffling is Capernaum because it was a place that was located in just a perfect place for a city to thrive. It was on the shores of Galilee. It's surrounded by fertile ground, excellent places to raise crops and to to have a commerce around agriculture. There are other cities today that are thriving. Tiberias, that was a city that was there when Jesus was there. It's thriving today. Nazareth is a boom town. There's even Magadha, where, where Mary Magdalene is from. All of those. Well, what happened to Capernaum? It lies in ruin. Perfect geological location, and it's a virtual ghost town. I heard about a pastor who visited there, and he wrote about it. Listen to what he wrote. He says, as we were standing on the ruins of Capernaum, sitting in the very synagogue where Jesus taught and healed, our Jewish guide made an interesting statement. He said, Jewish archaeologists are baffled why Capernaum became a ghost town in a wasteland. After he finished, I opened up my Bible, and I told the group, I know exactly why Capernaum is nothing but a pile of rocks today. And he read Matthew eleven twenty three. 23. And you, Capernaum, will not be exalted to heaven, will you? You shall descend to Hades, for if the miracles had occurred in Sodom, which occurred in you, it would have, been, it would have remained to this day. What does he mean more tolerable? What, are there levels of punishment in hell? I believe that there are, but that's not what he's talking about. There are levels of punishment in hell. There, 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 I believe that. But you see, God's judgment on cities and communities and nations is not that he sends them to hell. So if you think about America, it's not the danger that all the people in America are going to get sent to hell. That is not it at all. But the danger is that it will become irrelevant, that it will become ruins, that it will become a shadow of its former self. And that is the danger that America faces today. That is the danger. America makes Sodom look like a great place to live. When you consider the blessing that America has versus them, think about Sodom. It had no churches. There, were, there are 350,000 churches in America. It had no Bibles. Most of you have three, four, five at home. Even people that don't even think about the Lord have Bibles in their home. We have apps and we have websites that we can go to. I've got a, compu- a full application on my computer with all the commentaries and any translation of the Bible you would like. It's at our fingertips all the time. Sodom had no preachers. There are over a million vocational ministers in America today. Sodom had never heard the gospel. In America, there are 1,600 broadcast stations broadcasting 24-7 the good news of the gospel. We are more accountable than Sodom would ever be. We are more accountable than Capernaum because we stand on this side of the resurrection. In Genesis chapter 19, God made the decision that Sodom needed to be destroyed. Abraham stood in the path and says, Lord, let me, let me stand in the way for them. And he negotiated with God. And he says, God, if I can find 50 godly people, if I can find 50 righteous men, will you withhold it? He couldn't find them. And he negotiated it down. What about 45? What about 40? What about 30? 20? Finally, 10. And God said, if you can find 10, I will hold it. This proves that God is not some angry tyrant who wants to crush men like bugs. He is a gracious God, a merciful God. He is long-suffering. He is patient with us, a God of mercy. And Abraham could not find ten. 
and the wickedness of the city is revealed because when the angels came to visit, they came in the form of two young men and they beat on Abraham's door and let us come in and they wanted these two young men to have sex with them. That's why for years and years we used the term sodomy referring to homosexuality. Of course, we changed that because that was offensive and we changed it to gay, which used to mean cheerful and happy. And to now, there are a thousand different terms who can keep up with all the terms. America has become a reincarnation of Sodom. Actually, America makes Sodom look good because it was only one city. We're 50 states and thousands of cities. The moral climate of Sodom made God sick, and he did something about it. And I'm afraid eventually God will do something about America. How do you think God must feel about us? You know, back before Mel Gibson was Mel Gibson and we knew him, his first movies were the Mad Max series. I remember watching them because they were kind of B-rated movies. And then they became a franchise. And, but the, the theme in that was following a nuclear holocaust that, that the, the earth lay in ruins. And it was kind of guerrilla warfare, and there were these groups that would go around. They were gasoline was precious, and they were looking for gasoline, all these things. And there are a lot of Hollywood movies that take on that that theme of after an atomic war, after a, a, a something that happens to destroy us, and it becomes a barren wasteland. I believe if we could see America through the eyes of a holy God today, that that's the way He sees us. That we've lost our way, God. It's barren and frightening. I personally don't think that that a foreign agency is going to destroy America. I think we're going to decay from inside. It's already happening, guys. Choking out the life of a conscience of a nation. I agree with the Boston syndicated columnist Don Fetter when he said, the men who founded our country clearly wedded it to Christian principles. And I'm telling you that God is calling us back. But God is not calling us back by a political vote. Do you hear me? I preach a whole sermon on political evangelism and how that is not in the Bible. It is you and I going out as these 70 went out and we make a difference. See, some of you say, oh, I'm saved. I've got my salvation. I've got my church group. I'm just going to wait it out. I'm just going to hold out till the, till, the, till the Lord comes back. We need to remember that God judges nations on a moral compass and you and I need to set the thermometer for that. You and I to call our nation back. These harsh words of Jesus, woe to you, Chorazin, woe to you, Bethsaida, woe to you, Capernaum. And I think he would add, woe to you, America. Now, not a very happy sermon, is it? If we stop right there, it just leaves us kind of in, in hopelessness and despair. That's why, that's why you need to always keep reading. Because in verse 17, immediately Jesus, after these harsh judgments, changes and gives us something to celebrate about. Number three is the celebration. Now, before I get into these, I'm going to jump down to verse 21. Jump down there with me. Verse 21. At that time, he rejoiced greatly in the Holy Spirit and said, I praise thee, O Father, Lord of heaven and earth. I love that phrase. He is excited. He rejoiced greatly in the Holy Spirit. He was leaping for joy. He was thrilled. He was delighted, overflowing. Why? I want to know why. What makes Jesus happy? Well, he gives us four things. Number one, that Satan has fallen, verse 18. And he said, that I was watching Satan fall from heaven like lightning. Jesus is seeing things we haven't seen. He's seeing things that we don't see. And he saw Satan, Lucifer, the shining angel of the Lord, had pride well up in him, and I will ascend to the throne of God. And God threw him down, and it happened like a lightning bolt out of a thundercloud. Jesus said, I saw that. It's just like when he said, before Abraham, I am. (laughs) Abraham was, I am. He saw Satan fall, and these 70 disciples become a part of that. Do you recognize? See, when we talk about the fall of Nazi Germany and the Third Reich, we talk about the fall of it, right? Jesus is saying, you 70 are part of the fall of Satan. When you and I go out and and, and proclaim the name of Christ, when we speak against demons and when we teach people and people receive Christ and the good news goes out, we are contributing to the fall of Satan. 
He is shrewd and he is cutting, cunning, but in Christ Jesus, you and I have more authority than, than Satan does. We do. Another thing to rejoice about, he said that God's servants are protected. Verse 19, behold, I've given you authority to tread upon serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy, nothing shall injure you. Now we know that some sincere Christians have taken this to mean that you should show your faith by handling snakes, okay? Not going to happen here, okay? You can just rest your, or scorpions for that matter. I don't know why they don't handle scorpions, they handle snakes. That's not what Jesus is saying. As a matter of fact, he said, he used the word that you would trample on it, that you would, you would tread on it, okay? You would stomp it out to crush it. In Genesis chapter 3, that is a promise that God gave to mankind, that, 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 that Jesus would come and he would crush the head of the serpent. He's talking about Satan. And it's not our power, it's God's power. Romans 16, 20 says, the God of peace will soon crush Satan under your feet. So what is the meaning of this? It's not that we're to handle snakes. It's that people have an inherent fear of snakes and an inherent fear of scorpions. In other words, of dangerous things. That's what he's talking about. He says that God will protect you from dangerous things. If you are God's servant and you are doing God's work, you are protected until he is done with you. Do you understand that? It's not that we should be foolhardy and we should not be, take unreasonable risks, but he takes care of us. When Paul was shipwrecked on the Isle of Malta, you remember that story? He was collecting firewood for a fire, and out of the firewood comes this venomous snake, and he bites him, and the islanders were just, oh, he's going to die before us. They're waiting for him to swell up. They're waiting for his eyes to bleed. They're waiting, and nothing happened to him. That is what Jesus is talking about. I will take care of you when you are doing my work. A favorite verse, Isaiah 43 do not fear, for I have redeemed you. I've called you by my name. You are mine. And when you, walk, when you pass through the waters, I will be with you. And through the rivers, they will not overflow you. When you walk through the fire, you will not be scorched, nor will the flame burn you. For I am the Lord your God, the Holy One of Israel, your Savior. A third thing that he says that we can celebrate, our names stand written in God's book of life. Verse 20 Nevertheless, do not rejoice in this, that the spirits are subject to you. He says, I'm going to send you out. You're going to have power over demons. That's not a big deal. He says this, but rejoice that your names are recorded in heaven. They were ecstatic that they're going to get this power, that they're able to do these. He says, that's not the thing to rejoice about. Rejoice that your names are written in heaven. Casting out demons is not a sign of salvation. Judas did that. He says your proof of salvation is your name is written down in heaven. It's the perfect passive indictive tense. I know that just blessed your spirit there. What it means is your names aren't being written. It's not that they will be written. It's that they are written. As a matter of fact, the word written there is a word in grapho where we get engraved from. Your name is engraved in heaven. Engraved in heaven. In God's book of life, it is his family album. And just like we got out this week with my dad, and we're looking through all the albums, and we're laughing, and we're talking, Jesus has the book. He has it. And your name, if you are a believer, is written in the book of life. Is it? Is it written? You say, oh, nobody can be sure. Oh, contraire. Okay. You didn't know I spoke French, did you? In Revelation chapter 20, we know about God's final judgment against those people. And if anyone's name was not found written in the book of life, he was thrown into the lake of fire. Into the lake of fire. Right before that, it says, this is the second death, the lake of fire. We talked about this on Wednesday nights. Physical death is only the first death. It is when you get thrown into the lake of fire is the second death. You must be born again to avoid the second death. Remember what I told you? You're born twice, you die once. You're born once, you die twice. You die your physical death, and then you die in the lake of fire. You should rejoice, and you can be certain, because John wrote in 1 John 5, 13, these things I've written to you that believe in the name of the Son of God in order that you may know that you have eternal life. Are you saved? 
I hope so in enough. I think so is not going to cut it. You can know because the Holy Spirit seals you. You can know that you're saved. One last thing he tells us to rejoice about, and that is that God reveals truth to simple people. Thank God for that. Thank God for that. As we saw in verse 21 earlier, Jesus is overflowing with joy. At that very time, he rejoiced greatly in the Holy Spirit and said, I praise thee, O Father, Lord of heaven and earth, that thou didst hide these things from the wise and the intelligent and to reveal them to babes. Why would he do that? Well, the rest of the verse says, yes, Father, for this was well-pleasing in thy sight. He did it because it pleased him. Some of you don't think God has pleasure. He does. And he enjoys confounding. God did not do this to be ugly. He didn't do this so that some people get it and some people didn't. What he's saying is those, think, those who think they're so smart and those who think they've got it figured out, those people are never going to get it. But those people of a sincere heart will get it. Those that come to me like little children, remember that sermon, only children go to heaven, that will receive me as a child. Those people, that's the reason. We try to make religion and we try to make Christianity and theology so complex. And Jesus says it's a simple thing. My goal as a preacher is to try to preach that a 12-year-old could understand it so maybe some of you PhDs could understand it. You know? I heard about a college professor one time, he had a flat tire. He pulled over the side of the road. It was right by a mental institution. Right on the other side of the fence, there's a guy sitting there just watching him. And he gets out and he changes the tire. He, he jacks up the car and he takes the lug nuts off and he puts them in the hubcap. That's what most of us would do back in the day when you had hubcaps. Most of the time we'd lay them in the hubcap. Well, he pulls the tire. He steps on that hubcap. Boom, those lugs go everywhere. Down a drain. Every one of them are gone. He said, oh, what am I going to do? How am I going to do that? I can't drive a car without lug nuts on it. And the guy across the fence says, why don't you take one off the other three tires, put them on that one, and then you can drive until you get some lug nuts. So that's what he did. He was about to get in the car and looked over at that guy. He says, what are you doing in there? He said, that's pretty smart. I can't believe it. Man, what, what a good idea. What are you doing in a place like that? He says, well, I may be crazy, but I ain't stupid. I ain't stupid. My appeal to you this morning, after all that we discussed, my appeal to you, even if you're crazy, don't be stupid, okay? Don't be stupid. What facts were true then and the time that Jesus talked about that are still true today? Here they are. Number one, that the world is perishing without Jesus Christ, and we need to share that message. Judgment looms. Number two, Jesus is coming back. Amen? We need to be about this. The time to share Jesus is an urgent time. It's right now. And Jesus is still sending workers. Are you going? Let's pray together, okay? Father God, I thank you so much for just this strong message, Lord. Sometimes we want to, sometimes we kind of push under the mat that the most powerful, harsh preacher sometimes was Jesus himself. Because he loved people so much, he did not want them to get caught up in their own selves. Father, I pray today, if somebody here, Lord, needs to be saved, that they would feel this. They would need, feel the need to get their name engraved in heaven. But Lord, this is a call to us Christians. It is so important, God, that we answer this call. There are consequences if we don't answer it. And Father, if we do answer it, though, there's great celebration. So Father, bless us today. I pray that you implant in our heart the need to be right with you. God, help us to be better workers. Help us to pray for better workers. In Jesus' name, amen. You stand, guys. We're going to sing.
okay? So please don't be offended by that. Jerry Pate's going to dismiss us. Don't forget to sign up to eat this week and uh, um, bless you, okay? And we have a fun. Guys, you can feel this happening in America, can't you? And we really can. And we, we can do something about it if we'll go out and be part of the 70s, okay? Let's be part of the 70s. Jerry Pate? Sure. There you are. <laughs> All right.